Thank you very much, uh, John, for agreeing to meet uh, today for an interview. Uh, before we start, I have to say that a few years ago, you came up with the brilliant idea that we should interview people when they are retiring in order to keep a record of their thought or their memories in, in mathematics and their life. So my first question for you is, how does it feel to be in the hot seat now that you've initiated that process? As a victim, yes, it's, uh, it's poetic justice, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, so I just want to have a, a, an idea of uh, your early life starting in high school or before. Uh, when was the time that mathematics came into your life? I, I remember one or two incidents. I remember I had a very good teacher at school who uh, wrote an equation, sort of three plus, and then, then he put his hand over it and equals uh, six, and he says, what's under my hand? Mm -hmm. And then he took his hand away, you know, well, we said three, and he said, we'll call it X, he said. <laughs> this was one of my first memories of mathematics. I mm -hmm. thought that was a great idea. And the discovery of X. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that was early on, but at some point, presumably in secondary school, or maybe before you decided mathematics was something of interest to you. Right? Yeah, I, I was naturally good at mathematics and my brother, my, I had an elder brother and uh, my father was an engineer. And uh, so my brother did engineering at Cambridge and so I decided that I would do something different. <laughs> and mathematics was the different thing. Yes. But right at the start, before you, you started even Cambridge, or right at the time, you all do had a little spell in, in real-life industry in the British Aircraft Corporation. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, I, I was working on um, what, what were called mishmash charts, which are now, of course, entirely computerized. But at, but at that time, it was you had to calculate at what engine revs you decided, if you had an engine failure on takeoff, mm -hmm. at what engine revs you had to put on the brakes and and if, if it happened after that, you would, you would take off. So this is what I worked on. And that was a mathematics problem that you were doing as an intern when you were student? It was, it was more that I, it was not so much. It was a little bit of mathematics, but it was more computing. Uh -huh. So it was the, at the time when uh, computers suddenly started uh, getting much faster. So it's at the time where industry yes. needed to yes. with the men by computers, where yes. people doing the computation. <laughs> Actually, at, I, sometimes I did what were called ghosters. Mm -hmm. which were at night you, you, you looked after the computer uh -huh. and when it had a, a parity failure, which would happen sometime, you had to go in and alter it and then it continued on. Uh, I see. <laughs> you were the, the manual debugging. Yes. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's go. So you went to St. John's in Cambridge. How, how, was these, how were these years? What was mathematics like in, in the 60s? Uh, well, for me, it was, I found it in I, I suppose it's like many other people, you know, when you're at school, you're the best or one of the best. And then you, you get to university and you find that there are so many really brilliant people. So St. John's was a big mathematical college mm -hmm. and it had, fan, in my year, fantastic uh, mathematicians, actually. And um, so I felt quite uh, inferior to, to many of them, I think. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I was not very good at doing uh, exams, so I, I didn't do brilliantly, and uh, but it was an incredibly exciting course. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Are there any particular professor or, or pupil at the time or, that, that you well, remember? It, yes, I, I, I remember. Well, I, I remember lectures I went to, one-off lectures. I went to Dirac's last lecture as mm. Lucasian professor, for example, and and I remember I was studying quantum mechanics at the time. I, I had this supervisor and uh, I said I was reading uh, Dirac's book and I couldn't understand it because he says that um, the, the world motors on according to uh, the Schrodinger equation until you observe it. So why isn't this, this chair observing everything all the time? And I remember him saying, well, um, you should leave thinking of questions like that to Dirac. Which, which I didn't think was a very good answer. But then, but then when I heard Dirac speak, Dirac was talking about uh, all the difficulties of his theory and maybe it would require advances in mathematical logic to, to cure them. So I was reassured that 
even he thought there were difficulties. <laughs> yeah, my, my, one of my first memories of reading quantum mechanics was finding Dirac's paper on neutrinos mm -hmm. and realizing that the date of submission was 25th of December, so he had work <laughs> over for Christmas time. <laughs> Something like that. Okay, so you, you finish mathematics, then what's, what, what are the options? You have a degree? With well, I had a degree, but I didn't have a very good degree. And uh -huh. uh, but for some reason I wanted to, I was convinced I wanted to do research. So, mm -hmm. um, well, I, I was lucky in that I applied to Oxford to do algebra and I was, uh, well, I was accepted to do a one-year course, but since I um, didn't think I was very good at exams, I, I decided to go somewhere else. So, mm. And so I took a sort of easy option, which was to go to Sussex University, where the, there was a former school teacher of mine who was in the applied sciences department. So I ended up um, working with him. Mm. And at the time you, you entered in, in mechanical engineering, but you rapidly found that, again, mathematics was the real pool, or you were somewhere in between? What well, was I that? was very, I mean, many people have helped me, but I was very lucky because, because the said school teacher, in fact, didn't really know anything about research. But he'd already had research students who um, uh, were not, well, one very good research student, actually, who'd more or less fended for himself, and he saw in me, I suppose, some kind of talent. And he, and, he, and he went to the dean of the engineering department and said that, you know, you've got to transfer this guy to, you know, so, so that the same trouble that happened to him didn't happen to me, which was mm -hmm. really, really great. And, and, and we were both very lucky because uh, at that time there was, um, David Edmonds was in the maths department and he was running a, um, research program on, on partial differential equations. Mm. And a lot of incredibly famous uh, people were there. So I remember I went with this, this guy, Mike Alford, to um, one of the lectures of Stampakia. He was, mm. Stampakia was giving a course. And it was the second lecture. And uh, at the, uh, after the lecture, we were just sort of chatting amongst ourselves, saying how, how wonderful it was, which indeed it it was because you could listen to Stampakia and mm. you, you understand everything and saying what a shame it was that we missed the first lecture. And he overheard us and came and said, well, would you like me to give the same, the first lecture mm. again to you? So we said no, of course, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and at the time, so you, you were maturing, so how, how did you come about your research topic or your interest? What was, was the... Well, my, my former school teacher was interested in mechanics and I was mm -hmm. in a mechanical engineering department and so I started reading uh, Truesdale's books, mm -hmm. the introductions to these books, which are ju just wonderful, of course. So somehow I got this great enthusiasm for, for mechanics, but I had no idea what to do, actually. And uh, so then um, uh, Robin Knopps came to give a, a talk a, in this PDE program that David Edmonds was running. And we were talking to him and I, I was saying that I hadn't got any project. And he talked to Stu Antman. And Stu Antman came to some conference later. And, and I, I remember it was, a, it was extraordinary. So Mike Alford was, was driving his mini car from the campus in Sussex to um, uh, Brighton Station. Mm -hmm. And in the front of the car was Avram Douglas. And in the back of the car was me and Stu Antman. And Stu Antman said, well, you know, Robin was telling me that you don't have a project. Well, here's something you could do. You can go and look at this paper by Dickey. And this is what he does. And this is what you could do to it. And this was just a complete revelation to me. I, I, I had never understood that anybody could understand research at this level. Which is tr still true of Stu to this day, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I remember we're talking at a little meeting about wrinkling. And he says, I see what these guys do, it's a good question, and I know how to do it better, but I don't know if it's worth the time to do it. <laughs> So he, had the, he knew mm. exactly what mm. to do to this problem mm. in order to improve it. He wasn't mm. quite sure it was the right question. So it's quite wonderful to have so much ideas and to share with others. Um, so um, 
you, your thesis was on, on the dynamics of beams, and something you haven't really done much. But I find it something very interesting in, in, in your approach, which has always been the duality that you can see in your work up to these days, is starting with problem from engineering or elasticity or mechanics in general, and trying to extract from it some mathematical principle or the underlying principle. And I don't want to embarrass you, but here is a quote from a, a young John Ball, 24 mm. years old, mm. from his thesis. <laughs> and I think it's very interesting because I, I, and I want you to comment on it because I see it like the, the seed of, of what would evolve later on. And it's on page two, trying to explain what is your approach. And I think it's quite important, uh, even in the context of the time of the research in applied mathematics in, in the UK. You said, at this point, we emphasized that in contrast to the physical approximation used to obtain this equation, a deduction from this equation would be mathematically rigorous. Since all physical theories are in some way approximate, this is not an inconsistent approach. Were we to use an approximate mathematical techniques, it would be impossible to distinguish between shortcomings of the model and those of the analysis. Nevertheless, we hope that it will be possible to extend some of our methods to better model and more complex situations. So, what, how do you see that young John Ball? Do you think well, that I'm it's not, a research I'm not sure that was entirely from my head. I think yeah. I probably had got it from... Truesdell or, or somebody, but I still believe it anyway. Does uh, that in a way <laughs> shape the way you approach science and mathematics? Yeah, and I, think it, I, think, I think, you know, rigorous, like, rigorous mathematics and theorems are tremendously important in, in applied mathematics. And, mm. uh, and we, see, we see examples, you know, of numerical schemes that converge beautifully, but not to the answer, to, not to the solution mm. of the equations you think you're trying to solve and so on. So it's really, really important. Uh, Mm. Uh, particularly when, when the, the equations have singularities or something like this. So mm. then you can run into a lot of trouble without some rigorous theory. Uh, it's not that I'm against non-rigorous mathematics either, but, it, but, it, but I think that it has a... But what was, was it a, a different view of the most accepted view of applied mathematics and mechanics at the time in the UK? Yes, I, I, had, I had quite a hard time from... Mm -hmm. Should we say British applied mathematics at, at that time? Um, it was really dominated uh, by Cambridge, mm -hmm. and um, there were just one or two people like Brooke Benjamin, maybe Bryce McLeod, who were, in some sense, uh, involved in applied mathematics and doing rigorous things. It was really a minority, and in some sense, uh, persecuted might be a bit <laughs> strong, but oppressed a minority. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember once I, I gave a talk in. Um, uh, in uh, at some meeting in British Theoretical Mechanics Cloakroom. I think it was in Edinburgh, actually, and it was after my work on elasticity. And I was, I was saying, well, I thought that, you know, the the the, the growth conditions didn't cover the case of the neo-Hookean material. Mm -hmm. And somebody, I remember who it was, but I won't say, uh, asked this question. He said, so so the reason you think that um, uh, there's there isn't existence for the neo-Hookian material is because you can't prove it. So this is my, my first encounter with a, a truly aggressive uh, question. <laughs> Whereas the reason is that the growth condition were wrong. Yes, is, yes. Is, is, is still problematic. Yes, to, yes. It is still an open question. It's still an open mm -hmm. question, yes. <laughs> Very good. Um, but, I mean, we probably can come back to that there's been quite an evolution in the landscape of applied mathematics in the UK since, since that period. Right? Yes, yes, a lot. And, um, and you've, you've come to play an, uh, an influential role in, in setting a different type of agenda. Uh, but yet, do you still think, you, do you still see or feel a friction between communities or different approaches? Not so much now. I think, uh, I mean, there was a period when there really was uh, such a friction, but uh, not, not now. I think it's, mm -hmm. it's over. <laughs> so you finish your thesis and you go to uh, Brown. So Brown at the time must have been quite exciting. It was a, a big center of applied mathematics yes. and theoretical mechanics, right? That's right. And, uh, in, in this lovely old building, mm -hmm. uh, I really enjoyed being there. 
is that uh, it, would that an influence for the things to come? Because in terms of your research, I mean, you had this interest in more the apply analysis side, but you went to the center of dynamical system, and later on in your life, you were interested in a number of problems related to. Uh, dynamical systems approach to infinite dimensional systems. Yes, guess. my thesis work had strong connections with mm -hmm. people like Jack Hale and yeah. Fermos and, and Marshall Slemrod, actually, um, who would, I think had, who had been at Brown but mm -hmm. had, uh, had left. And, uh, um, but when I got there, I, uh, it was, I was on a postdoc and um, somehow I felt that I should try to do something perhaps more significant and also I think I was a little bit uh, not ashamed but but worried about the equations I'd worked on in my thesis were they mm. really sort of good equations and so I knew from a lecture that Stuart Entman had given I think in Newcastle maybe that I'd been to that there was this problem of existence in elasticity so uh, and when I went there de Fermos um, uh, very quickly told me what the the real issues were. Mm -hmm. And so, the, so then I started working on it. He went off to, to Greece and something, and I, I just spent these times, long hours in the library. There's a mm -hmm. wonderful library. Now maybe libraries are not so, you, not the places where you really spend a lot of time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but then it was a fantastic library. I could go back to all the old papers. And so I worked really hard on this. It was a very hot, uh -huh. Summer and uh, yeah. so the seed of your work on existence theorem for elasticity was right there, no, I, I, and I, you come back to Eriot Watt. No, I, I did it there. I did oh, it. That was all I there. I did it there, yeah. and uh, and I remember it was very very hot, and I, I was one afternoon I was just sort of lying there trying to survive, and uh, and uh, and then I saw this. Uh, um, I sort of made this connection between determinants and volumes, and I, I realized that the volumes should be sort of preserved under weak convergence because it was just mm. the area inside the boundary. And so this was, I guess, the crucial that was the crucial moment. You yes, knew yes, that yes, the spark. Yes. Yes. Was <laughs> so you, uh, after after that brief spell, you went what, six mm. months or so in, uh, in in Brown. You come back and and start at Eriot Watt right away. Yes. But, Yes, uh -huh. and how was how was that uh, change? Uh, well, that was uh, that was it was it was great. We were in in uh, the building in Chambers Street in in, mm -hmm. in Edinburgh. I, I was in an office which was below the sloping floor of a lecture theatre. So you know people would um, be tapping their feet in boredom at the lecture on, on you know above your head, and then there were great sort of clanks and they steam and the pipes and so on. So it was an unusual place to be. So fairly soon we moved out to the new uh, campus in, in Riccarton. But Robin Knopps had sort of created this department and, um, and it was very lively and uh, I learned more about continuum mechanics from him. Mm -hmm. you know, it, was a, it was a great time actually. And uh, eventually I had these, I was so lucky I had these Incredible students and postdocs, Stefan Muller, Vladimir Shverak, Zheng uh, Wei. I mean, you could not hope for better people. And how do you, what is, what is the secret ingredient, you think? I mean, you see sometimes in different fields, some people come together in a, in a given place for a few yes. years and create this center that change paradigm, change the way people think about a, a discipline, right, and really see it. How do you see, looking back, what, what were the ingredients that made that place special at the time? Well, it was a nice, it was a small department, um, um, so there was a kind of family atmosphere, but I think it was, it was in, in some sense, luck. So Stefan Muller, for example, he came on a, while doing his undergraduate degree, he came to do a, a year. Uh, with me, and then he came back to do a PhD. So he obviously, in some sense, mm -hmm. enjoy, enjoyed it. And uh, Vladimir Shverak, he came. Uh, he he was interested in work I'd done on invertibility, and he'd done some mm -hmm. wonderful stuff on invertibility. And he came um, for that. So I think it was just, in some sense, luck. You know, you you, it has to be luck. Serendipity. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, 
you cannot try <laughs> to recreate it in a way, or you I'll think that's it. But it always depends. I mean, I've seen that in a few few places, and usually it depends on a few individuals, right? One is not enough, but you have mm. two or three that are like-minded and really change. So yeah, you were there, Robin was there, was there any other yes. main players that made the, the, the yes, place? Yes, and, and we, well, we had a lot of, we, we applied for some grants and uh -huh. we had a lot of good visitors coming, uh, Luke Tatar and mm -hmm. uh, Parsi and uh, many people, Marshall Slemrod, Jerry Marsden. And, so it was an exciting uh, time, but it was a small place. So I think that's interesting because now big is beautiful. Mm -hmm. You know, we have all these centers for doctoral training and so mm -hmm. on. And uh, I suppose I've come to understand that there, that's a, a good way of doing things. But well, these people's careers w were not damaged by being in this small place with maybe not very good library <laughs> facilities. You know, it was and having time to think. Yes. And yeah. discuss. <laughs> So not, yeah, it's not a model we use now, but maybe it's a model we should think about. So it is, I mean, you spent 23 years in Ariot Watt, so you went through the rank. At some point in the 80s, you became professor. Is it, the, the professorship was Professorship of Applied Analysis. Is that a title you chose for yourself? I think so. Were you the, the, the first, you think? In, I think you the, could choose your own yeah, title. Sure, I, think you could I want to title. know what was behind you. Is that, is, defining your field or...? or? Mm. I, I'm not sure whether... I think that phrase was used mm -hmm. at the time, so it was just a natural... I probably didn't think about it uh, very much. <laughs> because there was a change, you, know, you mentioned all the people you brought, in the, the center, or what brought in the UK, they were... It was not the typical UK uh, applied mathematics or even mathematics in general. You were bringing something different, right? Uh, is, did, did that place was a seed for the rest of the UK as it as time went by? Or I remember getting uh, one person who gave a lot of support was Jim Eels from Warwick. I think mm -hmm. that he saw that there was something interesting happening. So that was, that was you know. Just odd comments like that are, are kind of good for one's morale, actually. Yeah. That, uh, but EPSRC, gave, or it was SERC then, yeah. or maybe SRC, mm -hmm. <laughs> gave us the money. So it was, it was not. Um, it was. It was sort of institutionally uh, blind in some sense. So, mm -hmm. so it was good. And at the time, there was the applied mathematics community in the UK, but there is also the mathematics in the UK which increasingly recognized that as an important part of mathematics. Is that the case? Yes, I think so. I, I think it great. I mean, there, was, there were other factors. There was, at some point, there was an influx of Russians to uh, doing sort of differential equations in the UK. They were working on maybe things I'm not myself so interested in, spectral theory and so on. But it did, it did increase the, the, the mass of people who had this different view of, uh, about how applied mathematics could be done. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, but we didn't have so many students, I mean, people like John Toland and myself didn't have so many students that populated mm. um, universities. Most, most of the people, I think, came from outside. I think that's still, still the case. Mm. So when... When you look back at these years at Ariat Watts, I mean, the, there's a great number of distinct work or branches of your work that you've that initiated at that point, right? So you work on dynamical systems mm. for, or methods for elasticity, or work on the, on subole function, interpretability, and things like that. So, when you look back at it, was it? Do you see it as the most productive part of your academic life, or, or maybe the most productive one is the, the, the ones to come? That's always difficult, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. I think people always think that what they're doing <laughs> is, is the at, next at, thing. At the time, <laughs> it's the best thing, but of course, other people yes. may, may think, <laughs> think <laughs> differently. Just when I, I look at the number of first of single author papers that yes. you produce there in different, you know, big That's papers, right. setting. Yes in very clear terms and mm. theory in a given field that become 
the first work, the reference work, you know, you work mm -hmm. on cavitation, early 80s, it's not the reference work for, and you can trace mm -hmm. all the work that came after. And, and, and the same is true for a number of other, other of the topics that you, st that you, you know, started at the time. So was it a productive, it certainly was a productive time, but how do you see it? How do you remember it? That's what my question I remember, is. I mean, I mean, one thing I remember is uh, somebody we haven't mentioned is Jack Carr. Yes. So I was just you know, at his memorial uh, meeting in, in, in Edinburgh and, and we were very good friends and we would often go to sort of football games together and talk about mathematics and uh, and we worked together with Oliver Penrose who was another mm. important influence. Uh, so he came from the Open University, and so that developed a new, a new topic. And that's uh, the work yeah. on the coagulation, coagulation equation. fragmentation yeah. equations. Mm -hmm. That's right. But it was not just that because um, Oliver was the person who sort of, uh, sort of convinced me that it was okay to to work with non-convex uh, mm -hmm. um, energy functions, even though apparently they might be. Uh, denied by statistical physics, but since he was a statistical physicist, it was, this was a big reassurance. And is that what opened the doors to your work on phase transition that came later with Dick James? Well, Dick was, vis Dick was yeah. a visitor to uh, Harriet Watt on, on, on one of these grants. I mean, it certainly was a, yeah. a, a sort of reassurance. Uh, no, that, that came because, uh, well, I'd met Dick before, mm -hmm. but uh, it was very interesting, actually. He, he said, he asked me someday, well, um, but what would a, a minimizing sequence for an energy look like that didn't converge to a minimizer? And so it was interesting. So I drew some kind of half space and some constant gradient below there and then some kind of sequence like, mm -hmm. that, like this. And he said, that reminds me of something. And the next day he came back and he said, that's an austenite martensite interface. <laughs> Oh, wonderful. So this is how it happened. <laughs> another, another moment where you can you you, you can trace the spark, the, mm. the one mm. the one discussion that made. Uh, are there other one? Or did, or did you came about the problem of cavitation? You have a long-standing interest in singularities, right? No, so, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how. Um, I think it probably came from these growth conditions. Mm. Seeing, I mean, so what what could happen if the the growth conditions were were, were not sufficiently strong, and, and 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 then I began to realize that maybe that x over norm x was something, and then I thought maybe of holes and. Uh -huh. um, I see because the growth condition yes. at infinity, I realize at the opening yes. of the ca the cavity, right, the stretch, the right. diverge, and so you have you don't have to go to infinity to realize mm. that <laughs> it's there. So actually, my, my, my paper on cavitation was uh, communicated by Brooke Benjamin. Uh -huh. And uh, now Brooke was a great expert in cavitation. His thesis was on cavitation in fluids. In, in fluid, yeah. and, and, and he told me a lot of, about these things. And so at that time, um, I think uh, you could maybe have more influence on the publication process than uh, you can now. So this paper got a, got a um, pretty negative um, referee's report. Uh -huh. but I, th I think it was from Rodney Hill actually. So maybe, maybe it was mm -hmm. not so ne not so negative as I read it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I remember Brooke taking very forceful action to get it, to get this paper accepted. So <laughs> I have to thank him for that. Uh, so Ariot Watts, 23 years. And so what was your next step after that? Or did it come about? Was that special connection with Brooke Benjamin that made you? Well, uh, I was very happy at Heritwad and I was really well treated there, as I have been in Oxford, I should say. But um, so I'd thought of, I'd been offered one or two things in, in the US, but I'd sort of decided I didn't want to go to the US. So um, if I was going to move, from Harriet Watt, which seemed eventually to be a good idea, um, just on general sort of grounds, it was probably to Oxford or Cambridge. And, um, and then this chair came up in Oxford, and so... Um, quite suddenly, right? Quite suddenly, quite suddenly, of course. And um, 
Yes, and so, so uh, well, I, I didn't apply for it, actually. Mm-hmm. At, at, at that time, it was, it was almost that if you applied for a chair at Oxford, you would, you would not get it. Mm-hmm. So, so I, didn't, I didn't apply. Eventually, I got some kind of feeler from somebody saying, well, might I want to apply? <laughs> and eventually, I sort of uh, did, a, did apply at some level, mm-hmm. and, then, and then I was offered it. And, and then it was a long kind of negotiation period. Um, this was because I was, first of all, I was very well treated mm. at Heritwad and I was asked to, and had to take a cut in salary to come to Oxford mm. and I was really mad about this and so I was negotiating A on this. So I had this idea that, you know, not understanding anything about the college system, that maybe if one, you know, because this chair was attached to Queen's, maybe if one chose a different college, I could maybe, you know, get at least match my my salary. No. So the that, market, yeah. then I was told that this would require an act of parliament. So this, <laughs> <laughs> so this idea was uh, was um, scotched, and uh, but okay. So eventually, I eventually I accepted and. Swallowed my pride. So the, <laughs> the chair of natural philosophy, the oldest science chair going back to the 17th mm. century. Um, is there any other chair of natural philosophy that still exists that you know of? Well, there's the, there's the, the Luca- Lucasian, Lucasian yeah. chair in Cambridge, of course, that's right, which was mm. once held by Newton. But mm. <laughs> And uh, so there is... Some, I always feel that there is something special about the name natural philosophy. So does it does it fit you your view of science and mathematics or the unification of both yeah perhaps um i think its main effect was that i, I get all this public you know publication uh stuff for, on books in philosophy yeah, i see <laughs> by mistake, by mistake. <laughs> but it's a it's a suit that fit fitted you in a way right so it's Coming and being professor of natural philosophy. Yes, no, no, I, I was, I was very happy to come here, and uh, it's been a wonderful mm. experience. So you come in Oxford and you start developing around you uh, a group in mostly nonlinear partial differential equation, right? You've been an advocate trying to push that yes. into the UK. It's to start with, it was very slow, actually. Okay. Um, there was a sort of one, I mean, part of my negotiation sort of mm-hmm. was that there was one position, which was uh-huh. more or less in my gift, I suppose, which, which went to Gero Frieseker, mm-hmm. actually. So, and uh, um, he didn't stay such a long time. And, and then it was several years before things started to expand um, more. Um, I, we, we had a lot of support from from successive chairs of the department, Nick Woodhouse, Sam House, and so and we got the this um, what's called science, science and innovation grant, which which formed mm. the Oxford Centre for PDE, and after that this CDT in PDE. So um, so so then it became a, a you know a, a group with critical mass. But for mm-hmm. several years, it was quite sort of delicate, actually. So when you look back at it, do you see it as something that evolved naturally or a lot of work in pushing it or fights that you had to go through? Or is it... Well, I think, I mean, Oxford has a, a unified department of pure mm-hmm. and applied maths, which is one reason why I felt it had a sort of big advantage to Cambridge, but but still, with you know, it's a very big department, and of course, there are people in it who have different views about what applied maths means, and so there was, there were certainly tensions. That, that's correct, I think. Uh, but um, I suppose slowly they may have dissipated. But mm-hmm. a, a, a bigger factor was probably support from the top within the department. I think, mm-hmm. um, but at the same time, by by the time it came to Oxford, of course, your work had been recognized both nationally and internationally. So you came with a certain weight, so you yes, were able think, to I influence the, the, the field. Yeah, but you, but you know, Allah, 
Nobody has so much influence in Oxford. <laughs> <laughs> I see. I, I remember that before um, I, I came to Oxford, I asked Michael Atia, who of mm -hmm. course had spent uh, many years here, uh, whether he had any advice. And he said, well, uh, don't raise your blood pressure by thinking you can change Oxford overnight. <laughs> he, was, he was certainly correct. Yes, yes um, good advice. <laughs> So academically or intellectually, you come to Oxford, it's a different environment. How did it change your research or you see it just as a continuation? Of... Yeah, I think it was, it was a continuation. Of course, it, it was possible here to um, recruit, if you like, high-quality high faculty, which would not have been so easy uh, at Harriet Watt, probably, even though there were very good people there. So in some sense everybody wants to come to Oxford or at least will mm -hmm. think, of, with, think of coming to Oxford. So that was a big, um, a big plus uh, about being here. Um, I, I had good students here but I wouldn't say they were necessarily better than mm -hmm. the students I had before but I, but I have to, I've had wonderful students and, and postdocs here. Um, I think it was, a, it, was an, it was a natural progression of course and I was involved in some European networks. This, this, these mm -hmm. were an important influence. Um, one and network with the U.S. also? With the, with the U.S. US too. Um, one should mention Europe and how important it was. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, still is to us. Uh, <laughs> I see. So you had a number of very, uh, very well-known research students in your life. So what's, what's your general philosophy or you deal with students about giving them problem or letting them come with problems? Do you have a, a general approach or advice? Or? I think it depends on the quality of the student. Mm -hmm. Actually, I, I'm, I'm much less sort of um, worried about the ability of the student than some other people. I, I, what's important to me is that they're well motivated. And, and then so, but I think how I treat students depends on some kind of assessment I have of their current background or, or, or quality. So maybe I might be more directive for a student who I think needs more direction. And, and of course, sometimes you have a problem which you really think, well, I really would like to see somebody work on this or work with somebody on this. And, um, and at other times, maybe you don't have... Uh, such natural problems, but you think that there's some kind of area and you get people to read mm. in that sort of area and then you try to develop a problem with with somebody, which I think is, this has worked mm -hmm. quite well in some cases anyway. Uh, so yes, in the uh, in the article about Truesdell you wrote with uh, Dick James, you, you quote Truesdell as saying how to, how to handle a student. You see, Truesdell says as as long as, as long as they, they're ready to work hard, you should be giving them time. But if they're not, they should be scorned. You know, if they <laughs> I don't remember that. I, I've tried not to scorn students. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it, as you said, it doesn't matter about the ability. It's the attitude that matters. I think so. I think so. Uh, and, it's, and it's amazing how people can develop. Yeah. It really is. And, uh, yeah. And we should maybe looking about the test score so, so closely. And I suppose you know my own my own uh, career that I didn't do particularly well in, mm -hmm. in exams at Cambridge has always influenced me. I, I mean, so I, I I know many many of the world's best mathematicians in some, in, in some sense, and and I know you know how quickly some people think, and I know I think much more slowly than this. But then, then there are, but research is something different. You know, it's, it's a question of what you work on and the timescales are completely different and there are different kind of qualities that can be successful, um, which are not tested in three hour examinations. You know? mm -hmm. Though thinking fast, of course, is, that's a wonderful, that's a wonderful so you, ability you, to have. And uh, So you, through your at least 50 years of living in the world of mathematics, you, you, as you said, you've, you've met a lot of mathematicians, maybe most of the top mathematicians in the world. Is there anybody who really stands out that you have 
memories of that, you know, that naturally. That... Well, I, I just came back from um, Oregon, where I met Jerry Erickson, who's now 94. So he's one of my scientific heroes, I think, and um, you know, one of the really great figures in mechanics. So he, he was very important to me, and, um, uh, and we had some correspondence. So at that time, people actually wrote letters. handwritten letters. <laughs> <laughs> and, but we had some very interesting uh, discussions, and he mm. certainly put me right on uh, a number of things. Yes. And, uh, Which is interesting, right? Because Ericsson was not one to collaborate, but he was... But he was ready to. But he was. But he was. Ve he was very interactive. So mm -hmm. Very interactive, and of course, when off, whenever you asked him a question, he would ask you a question. So I see. It was, <laughs> <laughs> and he still does. So. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Very good. Mm -hmm. So over the years, of course, your work is recognized, and it's natural it is that you are uh, asked to step up more for the community, and you've done a number of. Uh, you had a number of important positions in the mathematical world, including pres being presidents of the IMU. In general, how do you see that as a role of a, a more, I would say, senior mathematician uh, versus the time that you need to, to do proper research? What's the balance there? Well, it, it's, it's something that suits some people and mm. doesn't suit others, I think. Um, I suppose I... I'm not sure how I sort of got into. I mean, I, I was for for IMU. I was on the UK delegation mm. to to the International Congress, and um, and suppose I suppose that's how I began to. I won't say get interested in it, but, but become informed by it and, and 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 know some people, and I suppose it kind of uh, mm. grew from there. Um, Yes, obviously some people are more natural, if you like, I say administrators, but um, um, more natural for such positions than others. And, and it, uh, but okay, that's just just the way it is. I, I, I've been very lucky to uh, have these positions. I've enjoyed them immensely. And, uh, so you get to the uh, IMU, and you said as a president, you said. You, you've made some change. I mean, the Fields Medal is something of a bit of a mystery, you know, or shrouded in great secrecy for various reasons. Uh, so maybe you can give us some insight since you've seen the process from, from, from the inside. Well, I, I was twice on the Fields Medal Committee, once as, as a member and then when I was president um, it, it always used to be the tradition that the president chaired the Fields Medal mm -hmm. Committee. But when um, Jacques-Louis Lyons was president, his son, Pierre-Louis, was okay. a potential candidate. So he felt he couldn't chair mm -hmm. the committee. And then I think Jürgen Moser did. And then for a couple of cycles, this continued. But uh, we reverted to the president chairing, chairing the committee, which I think is important because there are guidelines um, for the Fields Medal that have not always been followed. Mm. Um, so, for example, um, two important guidelines are that you can award um, from two to four medals with a strong preference for four. And, and another uh, is that um, it, it should respect a diversity of fields. Mm. But in some cases, this, this didn't, didn't happen. And I think this was one of the reasons why we, if you like, took back control of the, mm -hmm. <laughs> the process. Um, so you, you feel you, your contribution was to make sure that guideline were followed? Was, or, yes, and, and well, that was, that, was, that was maybe something. I also, there, there was also the question of the age limit, mm -hmm. which, you, which is kind of interesting that you have to be um, under 40. So there was a question about exactly what under 40 means. So if you go to the IMU website, you can You've read what I wrote, which defines precisely what <laughs> under, 40, under 40 means. <laughs> Very good, including the latitude and the time at which. 
Okay, very good. But at the time, there was a, a singular event also in, the, in terms of the Fields Medal, is that one of the, the nominees for the Fields Medal was Grigory Perelman. It was, he was awarded yes. the medal, and the question, knowing him, was whether or not he would accept the medal. Can you, can you tell us about that? Yes, so, um, well, Perelman proved the Poincaré conjecture. But uh, at, at the time when the Fields Medal Committee had to make its decision, it was not completely clear that everything had been proved. This, this was one problem. But earlier than that, it was more or less clear that whether or not he had proved the Poincaré conjecture, he, had, he was a very likely candidate mm -hmm. for a Fields Medal. And there was this kind of past history so the executive committee of IMU considered what would happen were he to be awarded the Fields Medal and declined to accept it. And we very soon came to the conclusion that, well, as far as we were concerned, he would have the Fields Medal. If he declined to accept it, then that was his business. Uh, uh, because if you think about the other alternatives, they were not tenable, actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, you couldn't just, say, award three medals and not name who the fourth person was. This would just be ridiculous. And, and also, we, we felt that it was important to recognize the piece of mathematics, that if one didn't recognize this very important piece of mathematics, and somehow we would not be doing the job. So anyway, so in the, in the end, so that was a kind of preliminary decision that was made, which turned out to be, of course, what actually happened. And, um, and then we, we, um, we decided to award him a Fields Medal. And, uh, well, it was, it's a tremendous story that you can read about in, in Wikipedia, which is, which is pretty accurate, actually. But at some point I, um, uh, called him up and said, well, would you accept the Fields Medal? And he, he said, no, he wouldn't. And I said, well, can I come to St. Petersburg uh, to, uh, so that I can understand the reason? He says, yes, you can come. Okay, so and you, so had, you had to do it without anybody really knowing, otherwise he would reveal the... the yes, that's right. And, 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 and the four years, there's a, the four-year cycle of the International Congress is, of course, the same as the four-year cycle of the World Cup. Oh, okay. So, so, in fact, the day that I, I went to um, St. Petersburg, um, uh, um, England were playing, I think, Paraguay in the World Cup. So I went straight from the airport to some Russian bar to watch <laughs> to watch this <laughs> to watch this game. But then I spent a couple of days uh, talking to Perriman, um, and he uh, well, he maintained his his position and. Uh, uh, so that uh, was a very interesting time. We walked a lot around uh, St. Petersburg. And, um, and then there was, uh, well, there were various other strands to the, uh, uh, to the story, but, but one was the article written in The New Yorker by yes. Sylvain Assar, who um, mentioned your trip also. But well, that, yes. That, no, it, said it was controversial because, because some... Prominent mathematician from Harvard didn't go in very good. Yes, time. well, I, one one thing that I was lucky that I that I did or prudent, if you like, was that I talked to Marcus de Sotoy uh -huh. beforehand, so I knew that this was going to be some kind of reasonably big story. I had no idea how big a story it would become, but and so he told me exactly how you deal with journalists. You know, you can you can say. If, if, you, if you say this is off the record, they cannot quote anything at all. So most of the time I was um, That's the first saying there was off, off, the off the record, or it could be non-attributable yeah. or something. But the Harvard mathematicians who were mm -hmm. quoted in Sylvain Nassar's article maybe had not had the benefit of <laughs> in, <inside laughs> such, yeah. such advice. Mm -hmm. But what, what, what uh, terrified me was that they were going to publish this article with the, name, with the fact that Paramount had a Fields Medal before the International Congress because Which the Fields Medals are announced at the International Congress. And so I asked her to ask the 
editor of the New Yorker not to publish until the day of the Congress, especially the electronic version. Mm -hmm. And he refused, but he did. He, but he didn't publish until the <laughs> yeah. more or less the day of the Congress, or maybe one day before, or something. It must have been by that time a more or less open secret. And, uh... um, well, okay, you know, there are people who know, and there are people who don't know. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But it was obviously a likely to mm. be the case. But, for but at the time, mm. at the time, we still didn't know that he had proved the mm. Poincaré conjecture. When did that come? Well, I mean, that would have been a few months later. If you look at the citation yeah. for the Fields Medal, it does not I see. give the credit for, the for proof. proof. Of, yes. And we were pretty sure, yeah. but there were these different groups, and then there was the story about the plagiarism. And it was, it was a, it's a really interesting uh, <laughs> yeah, story. It's not, it's not every day you have affairs or scandal in the world of mathematics, yes. and yes. maybe the biggest in recent time, but it's also one of the biggest results that has yes. been proven. But it touched, it, you see, I, I thought that Perelman would get a bad press mm. for seeming to be ungracious. Yeah. Right. It's the very opposite. He, 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 he like became some hero. kind of popular hero yeah. of somebody with integrity, you know, yeah. turning down prize and awards prizes, and money, yes. because he also got the the, yeah. the Millennium Awards so from yes. the Clay Foundation. And then that really was turning down money. So yes. He turned yeah. down a million dollars. Yes. <laughs> so, just for my own, this was in around 2006, so it's almost you know, 15, 12 years ago. What's the situation now? With Paramount? Yes, with Paramount. Well, I don't know. I don't think anybody knows, but the assumption is that he's not doing mm -hmm. mathematics. but. Um, who knows? But yeah. for the IMU, he has a Fields Medal. It's yes, he has a Fields Medal. He could come and get it. If and you... I think for the Clay Foundation, the money is there. If you have no, no, the just... money was handed over to uh, the Institut Henri Poincaré. Uh huh. Yeah. At his at his request, or to sort of... uh, probably not at his request. No. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Okay, very interesting. So, uh, in in your work, I mean, if if you look if you look back again, you. As, as we said, you, you have interests motivated by science, and you have, but as you, you wrote in your thesis, you want to do rigorous mathematics. And there is always a balance between the two, but the first question that often students ask is this, how do you choose a problem to work on? So what's, what is your view about that? What is... Well, I think one thing is you should take responsibility for the model that you're working on. You shouldn't just say that, well, some physicist has told me that this is the right equation and, I, and then you, you just work on, on the mathematics of this and don't try and understand the physics. I, I think you lose a, a lot by this. I think, I think that to get good new problems, you have to interact with people, well, good, uh, if you like applied problems, you, you have to interact with, with people mm -hmm. who ideally do experiments. I think, I think if you talking directly to experimentalists is very valuable, then you, you cut out somebody in the middle who may have some sort of theory which is not, not, not so great, maybe. Make a mess out of the, <laughs> of the beautiful yeah. phenomenon. But of course, in, in, in talking to experimentalists or, or, or scientists in a different area, you know, that's a, that's, um, that's a very interesting thing to do, but it's, it takes a lot of time to learn somebody's language, and, mm -hmm. and you have to have this kind of mixture of um, confidence that you can say something that this particular field um, maybe could, could, could be useful to that particular field, but also some kind of humility to, you know, because you don't understand this other field. So it's, it's a kind of difficult, uh, but interesting uh, process, I think. And how have you experienced reception from the, say, the material science community? How do they see your work? In, in general, in general, it's been, it's been very good. It's a slightly, I mean, so I've worked twice on sort of, um, these modern cytic phase transformations, which was mm -hmm. interacting with material science. 
and also more recently on liquid crystals. So I think the liquid crystal community is perhaps more traditionally receptive of mathematics. So there was really no pushback at all there. But for material science, uh, there was a bit of a pushback. Um, you know, they, you know, but you're you're ignoring. You know, you're you're taking this idealized model and and doing this. You're ignoring this, that, and the other. You know, because materials are infernally complex. You know, it's just unbelievably complex. So. So you, you mentioned liquid crystal. You came about. You started working about ten years ago on yes. this, I guess. How, mm. how did you come about that as as a topic of interest to you? Because I, I was um, asked to be external examiner for Apollo Madrimda's uh, thesis in, mm. in in Bristol, and so um, so of course I, I'd heard many talks in liquid crystals over the years from from. Frank Leslie, in particular, mm -hmm. in, in Scotland, and um, and and Jerry Erickson. So, and, and of course, it was, in some sense, similar to elasticity. It's a it's a multi-dimensional variational problem, at least in statics. And so, I, I it was not such a difficult thing to mm. examine the thesis, but it made me think about. Um, this problem in a way I'd not thought about before. And it's just, you know, one little detail, then you start thinking about one little detail and then mm -hmm. and then it turns into a which underlies the importance of doing service things like examining theses that mean <laughs> other people might seem like a drag on your research, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. let let you your mind open to other things mm -hmm. on the seminars. Uh, so is how would you say what are your main research areas right now? Is, is it, well, it's, I suppose I'm more or less half still working on martensitic phase transformations and half on um, liquid crystals. And there's a little new interest I've just... Uh, so sometime in last December, Zhang Kei Wei, who was, was a postdoc of mine in, at, at Herit Wat, he was um, one of the organizers of a Newton Institute program on image processing. And so he was organizing a workshop and he said, could you give a... It was like in the old days when you were assigned a topic to talk on, which was um, elasticity and image processing, of yeah, which, I, which I, I think I know a little bit about elasticity, but nothing about image processing. So, so now I've got quite interested in this because there really is a connection between elasticity and image processing, or at least there are some elasticity-based methods. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So maybe this is a new area now, just starting. And that's... I mean, image processing is becoming increasingly important, and it's naturally related to a lot of the big data fashion that we see. Is what what are you view? You you would say you, you know people from outside would say you're a traditional mathematician because it's mostly theorem proving and maybe working with people who compu doing computation, but doing forward computation based on model, not. Inverse. So, how do you see that that new era of mathematics or science? Well, I think there's something genuinely exciting mm -hmm. that is happening. On the one hand, of course, it's maybe like many sort of new things hyped a little. I, what's striking to me is is the the um, it, it's as if traditional science and some of these machine learning methods are working in parallel universes. Mm -hmm. you know, so, I mean, for example, if you um, if you gave some machine learning program the um, the data for uh, planets moving in the solar system, right? Which, of course, historically, this is what happened. You know, people had the data for and and and. and and well, would such a program, you know, get you Newton's laws of gravitation and uh, Newton's laws of motion? Or, so, so there are, and well, it would probably do a very good job in predicting planetary paths, unless, of course, it reached some kind of instability, uh, which had not, which was not there in the original data. So, I think, I think, I think that there's, a, it's a big challenge now to, in some sense bridge the gap between uh, traditional science and these, these, these new methods. I mean, no amount of machine learning will 
will uh, predict something that happens in a small region of parameter space, which the data mm -hmm. doesn't cover. Mm. But nevertheless, it can help us. Maybe we haven't learned to ask the right questions, some of the right questions. Mm. Uh, but, but it's certainly an exciting, an exciting time, I think. Mm. Uh, of course, it's, I suppose, a little worrying as a mathematician to to see these developments uh, in, the, in that, um, you know, so computers will, well, are increasingly able to check proofs and when they check proofs, they'll no doubt be able to find proofs. And I went to a talk at a meeting uh, last week when somebody from, um, I think it was IBM was talking about programs for creativity and so on. So I think the role of, mathematicians is going to change. Maybe not so much in our lifetime, but in, in the lifetime of our students, it will change really, really dramatically. Yeah, probably, yes. Uh, so one thing that often mathematicians do as part of the natural evolution process is that they turn into either historian of science or philosopher of science in general. As you know, and they, I wouldn't say they pontificate, but they reflect on the entire field. Uh, it's something that I've not seen in your work. Uh, is that you don't feel you are at that point yet, or you don't? It's not new kind of things in general. You have natural philosophy in your title, but you resist philosophy of around you in a way. Um, I don't resist it. I mean, I, I, I'm actually, I, I've always liked looking at old papers. Um, it's amazing when you read, you know, papers of analysts at the beginning of the 20th century and how clearly they're written in prose, you know, so, so descriptions of you know, Lebeg or Donjois or somebody like this. It's, it's really great to read, to read these papers. So I, I am interested in uh, the history of science, and I think it's very important for people to sometimes go back to read, to read some of these uh, papers. But I've I've not felt the urge to write things on the history of science. No, the mm. trouble is I've got so many unwritten papers, not to say an unwritten book or an uncompleted book, that somehow I think probably if I feel that at some point that the creativity has dried up, I think it would turn probably into writing you know, this this book I've been writing with Dick James for mm -hmm. for years and that's probably more likely to I see. Well, be, we, be a route we, to we take. We are looking forward <laughs> to that. So apart from your role in being a good citizen of, of mathematics and science and promoting in various society, you've all also been very active and I was always very impressed in helping developing countries scientifically or at the mathematics level. Can you describe your activities there? What, what you do you think it's important? Or? Yes, um, I mean, I suppose that's something also I, 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 I might do more of uh, mm -hmm. if, in, if I, the creativity goes or something, <laughs> if it hasn't gone already. Um, well, well when, when I became president of IMU, um, I, one of the things that struck me was that the budget for helping developing countries was, was just pathetic compared to the, the demands, the, the need. I, it's, of course, things have changed now in that uh, maybe 25 years ago, it was largely a question of access to information. Hmm. Now, if you've got a... You've got a um, a decent internet connection, which of course not everybody has, then you can access anything. You know, you can, in Sci-Hub you can get any any paper <laughs> Sci-Hub. Um, so it's, but of course, accessing the information is not is not enough. You need to know what to do with the information. Right? I mean, so I think the story I told you about when Stuart Entman suggested this problem to which shows how you know, unless you know, personal contact from somebody who knows how to do it and who has done it themselves is absolutely essential. So, um, especially with the amount of information around, yes, us, you yes, have to know where to look. Exactly, and um, so, so, so one of the projects I've been involved with is this uh, mentoring African mm. research mathematics, and so that's one of the ideas to link up people from 
the UK and elsewhere with research groups in, in Africa to, um, to try to, to help them. But, you know, it, it's a question of maximizing the pool of human talent. Mm. Uh, so uh, it's good for everybody. And, and, of course, having good contacts with all sorts of countries is, I think, uh, a factor for you know, world peace, if you like. Mm. Mm. But you also done things at a lower level before research and all that with Tibet. Yes, well, can you tell us my, a little bit about his activities? Well, my wife is is mm -hmm. is from Tibet, and um, and so uh, I visited there uh, three times. Uh, each time, I think, also taking in the University of Lhasa, and uh, my my research student uh, uh, Basang Suring. Uh, he's the only. Math Tibetan uh, who has got a PhD in mathematics in modern times and he, he did his PhD here and he's now back in Lhasa at the university. So you, uh, you've you mentioned a few times, you mentioned again, so you, your wife and you often in awards you mention your family. Uh, it's always a surprise for people sometimes that you can be a mathematician and have a, a well-balanced and healthy and happy uh, life at the same time. So, can you tell us what is what's the role of your family within within your own work or within your own life? Well, uh, I mean, you, you've you've met Sida, so you know that she's a, um, a very interesting, and uh, I've been so happy to uh, be married to her. Um, but we're very different. We're very different people with different uh, different views on life, often, and and. Our children, yes, it's 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 of course the great experience of life having children. Um, but it's not always, <laughs> not always easy. <laughs> but that's how you like it. But just, we, but just, we, but we, just like for the important thing is right? we all talk to each other and we're all good friends. So uh. <laughs> you wouldn't like mathematics to be easy in a way. No. You want it to be interesting, <laughs> just like your family life, I guess. Yes, <laughs> Can all be interesting. Yes, when the last time you mentioned that you uh, are a very different person, uh, I think said I said, "Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I remember <saying>. yes. <laughs> agreeing with you on that one." <laughs> so what what would be, you know, we always being pulled in different direction, all that, mm. uh, and have to do a number of things in every day. But what would be your, your perfect day if you could choose it? You know. This, Uh, that's a difficult, that really is a difficult question. It's, um, well, I mean, sort of mathematically, of course, it's when you f finally solve the problem you've been worrying about for two years or something. That's, that's good. But of course, at, that's good and it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great moment, but then you've got to write it down. It, it's not, it doesn't last as long as you might think, right? Well, you know what and there's, and there's always new questions, yeah. right? <laughs> you know what Littlewood said about that. He says, yeah. when you have that moment, stop right there and go enjoy it because it might not last, it might yes. not be correct. Well, it might not be correct. That's, <laughs> that, that, that's another point, of course, and often that, yeah. often that happens. Uh, yes. So you should enjoy where it, where it lasts. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much, uh, John, for, for taking this time. Is there any other memories you'd like to recall? I think we've probably gone through, <laughs> gone through enough. <laughs> thank you. Thank you again. <laughs>